here on the Grimaldi Ferry, traveling from Barcelona to Italy, where I'll be giving a talk at the Compositional Data Analysis Workshop next week. I thought I'd like to give you a preview of my talk. So, here it is. This talk is entitled, Towards a Pragmatic Approach to Compositional Data Analysis. First, the usual limerick summary of my talk. Compositional data can be fun. Their values add up to one. Drop a category and re-express. Their values change. It's a mess. Rather use ratios. Then you're done. This talk is for all those researchers in the applied community who find the area of compositional data analysis rather complex. I hope to make it much simpler by this more pragmatic approach. All I assume is that you are aware of the fundamental use of ratios, thanks to the seminal work of John Aitchison, to whose memory I dedicate this talk. Compositional data are typically a matrix of n cases or sampling units and m parts. For each row of the matrix, the values add up to 1. Ratios are important because they are subcompositionally coherent, which means that adding parts to the matrix or taking away some and then reproportioning the rows to again sum to 1, an operation that is called closing the data, leaves the ratios unaffected. Ratios of parts can be nicely visualized in a graph. For example, the ratios A over C and A over B can be shown as follows, where the arrows point towards the part in the numerator, which is A in both cases. A fourth part D can be added, in the form of a ratio A over D, say. But if the edge from B to D is added, that is the ratio D over B, then this forms a cycle, and any ratio in the cycle is redundant. For example, going from B to A, using a type of vector geometric rule, is equivalent to going from B to D, and then from D to A. That is, the ratio A over B equals the product of D over B times A over D. In the logs, this is a simple additive relationship. So graphs without such cycles, called acyclic graphs, consist of independent ratios. To measure the total variance in a compositional data set, the log ratio variance is used. This quantity has many equivalent definitions. One is in terms of the variances over all pairwise log ratios. For example, the logarithms of all 10 ratios defining all the edges between the parts of this five-part composition. Many of these ten ratios are redundant, and only four are needed, connecting the five parts. For example, this graph. So, for m parts, m minus one edges, that is ratios, are needed that connect all the parts. Such a connected graph will necessarily have no cycle, that is, be acyclic and the four log ratios will fully explain the log ratio variance. Here are some examples of acyclic connected graphs. For three parts, two ratios are needed. There are a total of three ways such a graph can be defined, depending on which of the three edges is omitted. For four parts, there are 16 ways of defining such a graph with three ratios. For five parts, there are 125 possibilities. And in general, for m parts, there are m to the power m minus 2 possibilities. This is known as Cayley's formula in combinatorics. Now, let's look at some real data. These are fatty acid compositional data for three fatty acids, which we'll refer to simply as A, B, and C, for several samples of a minute marine copepod called Calanus glacialis. With the samples taken in three different seasons, autumn, winter, summer, and spring, indicated by the three colors. This is the scatter plot of two log ratios based on these three fatty acids. These two ratios are represented by this graph, and they perfectly separate the samples from, this, from the three seasons. How these three fatty acids, also called lipids, were chosen from the total of 40 that were available in the full data set will be explained later. This is the simplex version of the same trivariate data, showing the same separating lines. 
And finally, the log ratio biplot version, which is oriented to principal axes. And the two log ratios in the scatter plot are indicated by joining them with lines, which are the biplot axes. The same separating lines of the original scatter plot are now perpendicular to the biplot axes. Some animations will illustrate even better the relationship between these three versions of essentially the same result. First, the transition from the simplex to the log ratio biplot, which takes the points in the simplex out into real vector space. And the transition from the log ratio biplot to the scatter plot, showing how the two biplot, biplot axes become the axes of the scatter plot. That is the original scatter plot. Now let's suppose that these three fatty acids were the only relevant parts. And so let's add some random noise to this data set. One more fatty acid is added from the actual data set, but its values are randomly shuffled to simulate random noise. And the, row, and the rows are closed again to add up to one. Then another fatty acid is added. Again, its values are randomly permuted and the data reclosed, and so on, until we have added all the additional 37 fatty acids in this way. Clearly, this nice separation of the seasons based on the first three fatty acids will be rather obscured. This degradation of the signal in the data by all this noise can be shown in two different ways. The first way is to show what happens to all the log ratio distances between the samples. This first frame shows the original three-part log ratio distances plotted against themselves, so a straight line. When the first random part is added to the data, the vertical axis shows the log ratio distances using the four-part composition, with the horizontal axis remaining the three-part log ratio distances. So now let's see what happens as the random parts are introduced one by one. Eventually, the original relevant three-part distances are lost in the noise. If you think that dimension reduction by log ratio analysis is going to help you, then I'm afraid you will be disappointed. This is the initial log ratio biplot showing the seasonal separation. But as the random parts are added, the separation is degraded, especially between autumn and spring on the second axis. I can add here that if you initially set yourself the goal of discriminating between the three sets of samples, the two ratios that I had before are exactly the ones you will find buried amongst the noise. For example, a simple classification tree approach chooses exactly these two ratios in this noisy data and separates the seasons perfectly. These are chosen from the total of 780 possible ratios in this 40-part data set. But let's go back to the original unpermuted data, which has m parts, but because it is compositional, it is m minus one dimensional and has one redundancy. We know that it generates all the pairwise log ratios, which is also m minus one dimensional. So here there are half m, m minus one, minus m minus one, that's equal to a half m minus one times m minus two redundancies. And that's a lot of redundancies. We also know that all these ratios can be contained in the matrix of centered log ratios, which is a very convenient matrix with only m columns that represents all the log ratios and the total log ratio variance. This CLR matrix is equivalent to the LR matrix for computational purposes. It is also of dimensionality or rank M minus one, so it has one redundancy. So the CLR matrix is set up as a multi-response matrix. And the question is which log ratio best explains it? This question can be answered using redundancy analysis, a method with an appropriate name, which is available in the R package vegan. So every one of the half m times m minus one log ratios is considered, and the one that explains the most log ratio variance is selected. 
Suppose it is denoted x1 over y1. Of course, this log ratio explains its own variance, but it also explains some variance in many other log ratios. This stepwise procedure carries on just like stepwise regression. The first log ratio is fixed, and we look for a second one which, combined with the first one, explains a maximum of the log ratio variance. And this process is continued until either m-1 log ratios have been chosen, which will explain all the variance, or when adding a log ratio is statistically non-significant or has no substantive interpretation. So let's see now what I call pragmatic coda in action. It involves two people with the same initials MG, it's myself and Martin Grever, a marine biochemist who attended my course on composition plate analysis in Bremerhaven last year and liked the ratio approach. Using the same data set of 40 fatty acids, I made a list of the top 20 ratios and sent it to Martin. He chose either the best one or one near the top, as long as it made sense to him as a marine biochemist in the context of the species Cullinus glacialis. He sent me his choice. I fixed it in my stepwise procedure, made him a second list of candidate ratios for the next step, sent it to him, he made his choice, sent it back to me, and so, we, so on we iterated until we had a list with high explained variance and clear substantive biochemical meaning. This was the sequence of ratios chosen, and each time I show how the graph is built up and how much variance is explained. The first two that enter are exactly the two I've been showing before, which I called A over B and A over C. Eventually, after six log ratios had been selected, we already had 91% of the variance explained. It would have needed 39 ratios in total, that is, 33 more ratios, to explain 100% of the variance. But at this point, with just six, the procedure stopped. Because at the next step, the best candidate ratios were adding very little explained variance, and they were not considered interesting biochemically. This is the PCA of the six chosen log ratios. The three seasons are nicely separated again, and the two first ratios are the most prominent on the first and second axes. These six ratios involve eight fatty acids. So another option is to take the eight part subcomposition and do a log ratio analysis of the subcomposition. The six chosen ratios are just the edges connecting the corresponding fatty acids. For example, the first two, and then the other four ratios. This is just the graph shown again, but on the LRA plot. Notice how much more complex the LRA of the full 40-part matrix is, which is trying to represent all 780 log ratios by the edges of every pair of parts, and which contains so many points that are explaining very little of the log ratio variance and not necessary for an explanation and interpretation of the data set. To finish off, some quick slides of another application to the archaeometric data on Roman glass cups. 47 cups, 11 oxides, 10 dimensional. This is a complete sequence of 10 log ratios, showing the cumulative variance explained up to 100%. And notice the univariate statistics that can be conveniently reported for each of the actual ratios. This is the graph, where the edge widths are shown proportional to the variance explained in the stepwise procedure. And finally, a word about additive log ratio transformations, which have been neglected by the CODA school, although they were John Aitchison's original idea. These make the star graph and work perfectly well and are easy to interpret. One has a choice which oxide in this example should be the reference one at the center. It turns out that silicon oxide is the best one from a variance explaining point of view. It explains more variance in the earlier steps of the ratio entering process than other oxides. Interestingly, in the context of identifying relationships between oxides in geology, in a paper, I read that 
Quote, the oldest method is the variation diagram or Harker diagram, which dates from 1909 and plots oxides of elements against silicon oxide. So I am reaffirming analytically what was found empirically a long time ago. In summary, only m-1 log ratios are needed to fully explain an m-part compositional data set. Usually with the intervention of a practitioner and applying some straightforward statistical principles, much fewer than m-1 log ratios are needed to explain the data set's non-random variance that has substantive meaning. The log ratios can be chosen in a stepwise manner using redundancy analysis. The same principle applies to any more specific directed analysis, for example, to explain group differences or to explain a response variable in a typical regression situation, whether it be a linear model, generalized linear model, or classification and regression tree, and so on. Additive log ratios can be used and make a lot of sense in certain circumstances. They are easy to interpret and it is easy to choose the best reference part. Centered and isometric log ratios have interesting theoretical properties, but are too complex to serve as interpretable univariate statistics for practitioners. Straightforward log ratios are better. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. There's a written version online. As for me, I'm going to carry on enjoying this lovely Mediterranean cruise. Thank you.